Assalamu alaikum, you're watching Fusion News and I'm Faisal Rahman live from our Islamabad studios. Today we'll be talking about uh, the very important story and that is about the killing of Emil al-Zawari in Kabul. And uh, this particular operation was conducted by the Americans. They used the Hellfire missiles which were launched from a drone and eventually he was killed, interestingly, in the downtown of Kabul. Now, we always used to believe that most likely Al-Qaeda has been eliminated uh, from Afghanistan. But when you talk about the number one leader, who was none other than Osama bin Laden, was also killed inside Pakistan. And there were reports that maybe he was living in Pakistan for quite some time, though he used to commute from Afghanistan to Pakistan. And that was done exactly 11 years ago on the 2nd of May 2011. Now, number two, who eventually ended up uh, becoming the main man for Al-Qaeda, who hails from Egypt, was in favor of the killing of Anwar Sadat, was a hardcore Muslim fanatic, eventually ended up in Afghanistan and was killed the day before yesterday. Now, most important part is that what is going to happen now? Were the Taliban on board? Uh, was this particular strike already planned? If the strike was planned, uh, what about the government of Pakistan? Were they also informed? Because when it comes to the 2nd May 2011 incident of Osama bin Laden, uh, we got to know that uh, we were not on board. Or oh, there were mixed stories coming out, if you remember. But now, we'll be talking about this particular story in detail. Before I introduce you to our uh, panelists, our production team has uh, prepared a report. Let's watch that first. America's drone attack in the Afghanistan's capital, Kabul, in the realm of countering the terrorism, has once again put a great question mark on the credibility of the Taliban-led government and their respective pledges, which they guaranteed to fulfill in the Doha Agreement 2020 regarding not allowing the Afghanistan's territory to be used by terrorist groups such as Al-Qaeda to threaten the security of other countries. These pledges paved the way for the withdrawal of U.S.-led foreign forces from Afghanistan. In this regard, United States President Joe Biden, in a special televised address, from outside the White House said that the justice has been delivered and this terrorist leader is no more. On the other side, the Taliban confirmed the attack in Kabul and claimed it as a violation of international principles and the Doha Agreement. In another statement, the United States Secretary of State Antony Blinken said that al zawahiris presence in Kabul grossly violated the Doha Agreement and repeated assurances to the world that they would not allow Afghanistan territory to be used by the terrorists. Pakistan's stance in this regard was conveyed by the spokesperson of the Ministry of Foreign Office, Mr. Asim Iftikhar, in which he clarified the unwavering stance of Pakistan regarding complete intolerance towards terrorist entities. In his statement, he said that Pakistan condemns terrorism in all its forms and manifestations. He added that Pakistan's role and sacrifices in the fight against terrorism are well known and said that they have seen the official statements by the United States and media reports regarding a counter-terrorism operation carried out by the United States in Afghanistan and Pakistan stands by countering terrorism efforts in in accordance with international law and relevant United Nations resolutions. Now to talk about this, we have with us in our studio on my right is um, Yasser Chinjua Saab, Senior Analyst. Yasser, pleasure to have you in the program, sir. Thank, Thank you. you very much for your time. And on Skype, we have with us uh, Dr. Akab uh, Malik Saab, expert on foreign affairs and international relations. Thank you very much, Akab, uh, for your time. Pleasure to have you in the program. And uh, from the United States of America, we'll be talking to Anwar Iqbal Saab, who's a senior journalist based in. Uh, USA and he's going to join us in a little while but let me start off from you Yasser uh, Jinwasab the main reason why the Americans invaded Afghanistan in 2001 if I'm not wrong that was the 7th or 8th of October when we heard that missiles have been fired now interestingly sir uh, <coughs> Osama bin Laden was killed after 11 years <laughs> and then Furthermore, after 22 years, Eamon Al-Zawari was killed as well in a drone strike. That was a separate operation conducted. This was through a, a missile strike, the Hellfire, while he was standing on the balcony. And he has his family there and he went to meet them. And interestingly now, it is also believed that he was under surveillance. He was under observation and they have been monitoring him for quite some time. So the right time, right moment, right place, he was taken out. Repercussions, sir, the fallout factor. Your take. Uh, Faisal, thank you very much. First and foremost, such operations do not happen overnight. 
So he was definitely under surveillance and under observation because they killed him at 6 a.m. in the morning while he was standing on the balcony. How did somebody find out if he was on the balcony? And if he was, or somebody did report at that particular moment whether he was standing in the balcony. So from where did the missile come in? It, either it was launched from within Afghanistan or some neighboring country or some uh, distant country. Biden distant says location. that without having a single boot on ground, right. we have eliminated so, him. Uh, there has to be some, some forces or some collaboration between the... I, I want to assume this has not happened without the consent, the consent of the Taliban government. Mm -hmm. And I want to uh, believe that. Why am I saying this? Is because Taliban are obviously against, uh, or th their enemy, known enemy is ISISKP, which is, and which is the enemy of Americans as well. So there is a common ground for both the U.S. and the Taliban at the moment to root out the IS ISKP. However, having said that, as you were saying in the intro as well, in the the, the package that you showed, uh, yes. If we go by the book, this is the violation of the Doha Agreement. But how do we know if this has been a, uh, violated or not? How, how about if the Taliban were actually part of this? Because I just can't believe that without some local help or assistance or know-how or this knowledge, was not possible this wasn't any. possible. Mm -hmm. So there has to be something connecting which maybe in some time it is uh, leaked or we find out. But it, this, it, this just couldn't happen. Now, repercussions. Uh, unfortunately, Americans have uh, tried such things in the past as well. And the advisory, the, the, soon after this incident, the advisory that the American government, the State Department has given to their nationals is, do not travel to Afghanistan or do not travel to such places where are there, there are risks. Because they feel and they know that there might be a fallout, mm -hmm. there might be a reaction. However, I personally feel at this particular moment, Al-Qaeda is quite splintered and franchised and not a coherent uh, force as it used to be. Uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri was most of the time spending time in hibernation and because the group had actually become, there were some splinter groups and uh, ISIS being one, ISIL being mm -hmm. one, which is a shootout or offshoot of uh, Al-Qaeda. So Al-Qaeda is not as strong as it used to be. So why then would the Americans need to create trouble for themselves by eliminating somebody, a 71-year-old man whose group is no longer as effective <coughs> as it used to be? As yeah. it used mm -hmm. to be. So I, I find that this is going to have some repercussions. And this is happening at a time at when globally there are things going on. You know, there is, there's a continuous war going on in Europe, and then now there are tensions between China and America over Taiwan, and now you find... So, once the Americans left the Afghan soil for good last year, they should have realized that, well, we should let the Afghans deal with their problems there themselves. But they can't just think about completely relinquishing control of such an important area. And that's why you find they came back to General <coughs> Zawabri, maybe because, uh, quite rightly, some people say, Joe Biden is do not doing well at home. And he needs some optics to show to his people. Because uh, on foreign policy front and on domestic policy front, Joe Biden is considered the most weak US president in recent history. So maybe he's trying to get what the Barack Obama achieved by killing of, of, of Osama bin Laden, he's trying to replicate. But unfortunately, Osama bin Laden and Ayman al-Zawari, although he, was, he is Osama, uh, Osama's successor, but he's not that towering figure as Osama was, despite the fact that he was a master, one of the masterminds of 9-11. But now he's no longer relevant, or he was no longer that relevant as the group used to be or Ayman al-Zawari himself used to be. Because we have not seen in the last many years something happening from Al-Qaeda side. Mm -hmm. It is because effective intelligence, uh, good operations by the global uh, coalition mm -hmm. against terrorism. <coughs> so, I mean, well, I am absolutely okay for the idea to eliminate somebody like him, which is perfectly right. 
But the timing and the way it has been done can actually bring a lot of trouble in the in the months and years to come. And we'll have to see. It all it it also shows now we'll have to see wait and see who does Al Qaeda nominate as his successor. So that will also indicate how much of importance Al Qaeda has in the world politics today. Because that's something. There are a couple of names being taken. And then there are other options, but we'll not talk about it then uh, right now. The question is, this is something that has been orchestrated with the help of, this is my opinion, and I could be wrong, but I think the Taliban have something to do. This regime was on board. So perhaps uh, the meeting that took place between the senior leadership of uh, the Taliban and the Americans, and uh, then we got to know that a certain amount of money most likely will be released. The, the Awan money... There has been some American give and take, way. you know. There has been so, some give so, and take. So, so the, I, I believe that most likely. But they have also condemned uh, the attack. But on the face of it, what, what, what do you expect them to do? <laughs> they have to condemn because they have to... Uh, there is a domestic politics that they have to play with as well. They can't just sit there and say, well, we are, we are happy about it. Because it's been that's almost, almost one year uh, since the Taliban uh, took charge yes. of the Afghan government, sir. 15th, uh, of, 15th of, uh, of August. August, and this like is the 12th of August. Away. Exactly, almost a year. Yeah. Now, the point is, sir, that during this one year, since the regime wasn't recognized, the Americans were not at all ready to talk to them, uh, they were not ready to release their funds, and perhaps they were under a lot of pressure. Do you believe, sir, that now, <clears throat> since this man has been taken out, one of the major adversaries of the Americans uh, is no more. Do you think the cooperation between the Taliban and the American government, this is going to go forward now? <clears throat> I don't think they will start cooperating on a level they, they cooperate with others. What they've come to realize is that Taliban is a reality now. So that's why you find that they are talking to them behind closed doors. But there will not be a greater degree of cooperation. And as I said in the, uh, in the previous statement, that... Amanul Zawahri, taking away of Amanul Zawahri is not going to be a CBM for the two countries. Yes, he's been taken away, but he was not a major irritant per se. Mm -hmm. Even when Taliban had taken power and Americans had gone away, as I said, and he was probably, to his bad luck, he got killed there. I think what the reports are saying, that he had come there to collect his family and move somewhere else. So he was actually looking to move out because either the Taliban had tipped him off to go away, or he had found out that I'm going to get killed and Taliban is going to probably... There's a double game being played. Yeah. All right. Now, let me also bring in uh, Dr. Kaab Malik now. <clears throat> Dr. Saab, one important factor, since now uh, one of the major adversary of Pakistan, and that is none other than Mullah Fazlullah, the head of the Tariqe Taliban, uh, Pakistan, who lives in Afghanistan in the bordering neighboring area. The Americans, if they were so interested to keep Pakistan on board and to look after their concerns, the legitimate concerns I'm talking about, don't you think if they had an eye on Al-Zawari, what about Mullah Fazlullah? Well, I don't doubt that. Uh, they probably do have an eye on him, but <clears throat> you've got to appreciate that uh, the two people are very different. Um, <clears throat> Fazlullah is based in the, most likely in the eastern uh, provinces of Afghanistan, uh, which are quite mountainous and very difficult uh, terrain. The Americans had many problems there before. Um, prior to uh, leaving, in fact, they had lots of issues there. So did the Afghan government at the time. Uh, so I think it's, it's, it's not certain that they would be able to do anything or whether they did or not. And on top of that, they still want to maintain a certain degree in contact with the Taliban. Now, you've got to appreciate also that there's another dynamic in play now. The fact of the matter that they do not need Pakistan in the way they needed Pakistan previously. And as a result, were, the situation has changed drastically. Um, they may well want to keep uh, people like this around to form an irritant to Pakistan uh, as and when it suits them. I mean, the fact is, this is how, uh, unfortunately, the game is played. Uh, Pakistan's played the game many times. Uh, so as uh, Taliban and the Americans are not new to this. Uh, all over the world, you don't maintain virtual global hegemony without understanding global rea the realities on the ground and in conjunction with the global realities and how it might affect other nations. So I think it's very important to appreciate that. But, but there's no certainty. Uh, again, 
and there's no definitive answer to this because you can't blame or you can't allege something without evidence and there is no evidence to this extent. Uh, we do know there is evidence that the United States did attack uh, al-Zawahiri and they did kill him. Uh, and that's evident because that's broadcast throughout the news and that was declared by the United States. However, on this front, it, it's not. And I think it's important to realize that even Pakistan, um, if they were willing to, could take him out, I think. I think Pakistan has more ability to deal with Fazlullah than the Americans have in this respect. Now that the Taliban are in charge, uh, American boots on the ground are virtually going to be impossible without uh, acquiescence of the Taliban. And they're not going to allow that to occur. I don't think so. Um, as far as Al-Qaeda is concerned, um, let's look at it this way. For 20 years, more than 20 years, uh, 25, 26, since it came into power in Afghanistan, and before that even, uh, Taliban has been in touch with Al-Qaeda. Uh, and before that, during the Afghan Jihad against the Soviet Union, uh, bin Laden was an intrinsic part of the uh, Mujahideen um, and the movement to oust the Soviet Union. Uh, with the acquiescence of the CIA at the time. So it's a big jumble and gray area. And if you uh, try to want to get uh, a definitive answer, it's not going to happen anywhere. And nobody's going to admit anything, I don't think. Uh, the intelligence community is adept at this. And they, they, they would rather keep the cards close to themselves um, and require to use them when they want, when it's their advantage. And it's a big advantage to use this particular card, if they know something about it, when there's a need to use it. Uh, at this moment in time, I think Pakistan is going through turmoil economically. Um, as to what the cause of that is, um, whether it's just internal issues or externally, external involvement from other parties, is another question, because there is no evidence of this. And I think we need to play on the evidence that we have. And as a journalist, you know, you can't broadcast uh, um, conspiracy theories, because uh, that would undermine your credibility as well. So I think it's important to realize when we have sufficient evidence that we can allow ourselves to uh, indicate what it is, and we need to provide proof and proof of that. Um, but as far as this is concerned, I think I'd be talking uh, in a dark area um, if I was to uh, indicate that the Americans did know, uh, because we don't know, and whether Pakistan knows what, why they're not doing anything about it, because we don't know. Uh, there's a fine line between the, the dynamics of conflict in Pakistan and Afghanistan right now. It's especially in Pakistan because I think the Americans also do not want Pakistan to ignite uh, further than it is now because economically it's in turmoil. Over the last month, only a month, the Pakistani rupee has gone down 20% um, virtually. I mean, this is unbelievable. Um, so, so to ignite some other issues in the country would just be tantamount to uh, causing uh, a virtual coup in the country. You, you're going to invite forces into the country in Pakistan that you do not want. You don't want. The Americans never really have wanted that much instability in Pakistan because it's detrimental to themselves and their interests further afield in India, in the Middle East, in Afghanistan and Central Asia. Pakistan is intrinsic to this. Nobody wants instability in Pakistan. And as a result, I don't think the Americans are going to play any card like this uh, whatsoever. I think they're going to keep it to themselves if they have it. And so too for Pakistan. I don't think Pakistan's in the interest of Pakistan to to uh, um, um, kill uh, Fazlullah by primarily because that would cause an uprise of uh, guerrilla attacks and terrorist attacks in Pakistan at a point where it's very vulnerable at this point, point in time. So as a transition is occurring, the worst thing you can do is to knock it over the edge. Um, I don't think anybody wants to do that. And it's a fine line. I think politics being played at this moment in time is very uh, um, black and not black and white, very gray. And it's cloudy and murky. And nobody wants to upset the, the moment at this point in time. So I think it, it's blowing in the wind, really, uh, when you say that uh, Americans know, or the Pakistanis know, or the Afghanis know, and everybody should do something. Uh, that's not how you play politics. That's not how you do strategy. Strategy right. is uh, is very definitive in this respect, and that's not the way to do it. Now, <clears throat> interestingly, now uh, this man had a bounty of twenty five million dollars. I mean, that's not a joke. Man hailed from Egypt. Was a doctor. Was a surgeon. Interestingly. He was Osama bin Laden's surgeon. Yeah. Now, just imagine that uh, this man converted into an extremist and eventually ended up doing whatever we have heard. 
Now, we've also been joined in by Anwar Iqbal Saab, senior journalist, joining us from uh, United States of America. Assalamu alaikum, ji. Anwar Iqbal Saab, assalamu alaikum. Ji, wa alaikum assalam. Good to have you in the program, sir. Thank you very much for, for your time. Now, sir, <clears throat> the government of Pakistan has also uh, condemned terrorism in all forms and uh, manifestations. They also said that Pakistan has uh, sacrificed a lot uh, and all these sacrifices are well known to the entire globe. Now, so killing of uh, Al-Zawari in Afghanistan, interestingly, the man was being tracked uh, for quite some time. This is what we learned from uh, Mr. Joe Biden, the U.S. president. So tell us about the news, the way they have been received in America, in the public in general, sir, and about the media. Anwar Saab? Well, it has been seen as a positive news here. Yeah. They are happy that they got rid of another person who planned the 9-11 attacks. And they obviously wanted uh, Washington to kill all those who were involved in it. That this, this is the general national sentiment in this country. They see them, them as America's enemies, and he was uh, had been listed as America's enemy number one for, you know, years, decades, actually. So people are generally, they, they see this as a politics news, but there is not much excitement because now more than 20 years have passed since 9-11. So, and uh, they will get, I think Biden will get some political mileage out of it, but not much. Now, Anwar Balsa, <clears throat> we all know that year 2011 was uh, a year when the differences uh, were very obvious between the United States of America and the Pakistani government. I remember it was the time when Pakistan People's Party uh, was uh, uh, looking after the affairs in Pakistan. Three major incidents happened, sir. One was about the killing of Osama bin Laden and the way it has been reported and the way it has been projected through documentaries and uh, Hollywood movies. Second was about uh, the Raymond Davis case, sir. We all know what happened, how it happened, and how you went away. Mr. John Kerry had to come to Pakistan to rescue him. The third and the most important factor, again, was the Salala incident in which about 27, 28 precious lives were lost all in one year. And then Pakistan had to practically stop the supply of NATO. And I remember Hillary Clinton, who eventually became the uh, Secretary of State over there. She never said sorry to us. Never was the case when she condemned. Uh, well, um, we will look into it. You know, this is how it was um, told to us. Now, sir, don't you think this is the time that, you know, if America really wants to improve the relationship between these two countries, they should also look after the affairs and the, as I said, legitimate concerns of Pakistan, whether in the form of Mullah Fazlullah or, or the most wanted residing in Afghanistan and planning against the stability of uh, our country. Now, tell us, sir, do you think that if Joe Biden takes a step forward, this could be something that is really going to cement the relationship between Pakistan and United States of America. Anwar sir. First of all, I, I don't understand what America can do now about uh, those hiding in Afghanistan. America has no troops in Afghanistan, no influence in Afghanistan. America is out of Afghanistan, so I don't think that America can really help us physically inside Afghanistan in finding the uh, uh, Taliban Pakistan people. Uh, the only help we now need and we probably can get from America is some support for our economy. I think America does. Again, I mean, I don't know why we do that. We sort of go back and forth about, you know, as if this was a personal friendship between America and Pakistan. It was a childhood friend who betrayed us. There is never a friendship between two nations. But always a exchange of interest. When your interests and their interests match, you become friends. And there is a clash of interest to drift away. I mean, there was a time when China and India were very close. And then, you know, they had, had a clash over some areas and they became sworn enemies. You see how their relations are now. There, are, there is a lot of uh, common interest between China and Pakistan. And that's why Pakistan and China are friends. So now with America, American policy has changed a little bit, uh, or, or rather a lot, about our region. Now they see China as enemy number one, and they also understand that Pakistan has its own 
compulsion that Pakistan is not going to play the role against China that it did against the Russians in Afghanistan. Pakistan will not get involved to the extent they would like Pakistan to get involved uh, in, in their conflict with China. And therefore, now Pakistan is not in the first year of uh, American trend. It is still a friendly country. America would still like to have good relations with Pakistan. And I think Americans are helping us with the IMF. Americans are helping us in getting even money from the Saudis. I mean, to us, it seems like the Saudis are uh, our all with their friends and they are giving us money and everything. But the, even the Saudis do not, uh, are, are not willing to give you, give you financial support without the IMF and the World Bank, uh, bank endorsement. And Americans are helping us there. They do not want Pakistan to think, or do not want Pakistan to become a failure. But they, they, so they will support us there, but only to a certain extent. Now, one quick comment, sir, <clears throat> and that is about uh, the State Department. Uh, statement. They said that they, in fact, they, they, they warned uh, the U.S. citizens overseas that there is a higher potential of anti-American violence following the killing and that uh, Al-Qaeda supporters may seek to attack U.S. facilities, personnel or citizens. Now, I also uh, heard Mr. Joe Biden saying that, you know, you never know that there could be mm -hmm. another plan in making just like 9-11. Your take. You think the, the Al-Qaeda setup has that kind of strength? that they can plan something of that sort? Well, I think that is a mystery. It remains a mystery. I mean, to, uh, it has been weakened, no doubt. This top leadership has been eliminated. But you see, uh, we have seen from our own experience that the political movements or even ideological movements like that. And I, I, I kind of does believe in an ideology. Uh, no matter how they started, that ideology is no matter what they want is uh, actually very, very negative. They want destruction, they want violence in the world. But uh, at, the same, at the same time, it is, it is still uh, whatever they believe in, but it is still a committed group of people. And therefore, I think all you, take, all you need is there's a bunch of people who do something as big as 9-11, you know. Uh, so, I mean, I don't, do not doubt the American fear uh, of their game. They don't think that, they, that an Al-Qaeda attack is actually going to happen, but they do fear and therefore they do keep, they, they keep their public uh, uh, informed. And there's another thing that we need to understand about these warnings. See, uh, when you when you come to America, they make you feel out forms that say that you have not been involved in drugs, that you have not been associated with, uh, with terrorist organizations, blah, blah. And somebody was asking me the other day, why do they ask these questions? I mean, who would say that he was involved in drugs or he's working for a terrorist organization, even if he was? I said, well, that is not the purpose. The purpose is they want you to write it down on a piece of paper so that tomorrow, if they want to deport you, they have, instead of starting the entire deportation pro pro uh, process, that because that takes time, they will simple, apply, use a simple method that you lied on your papers while applying for a U.S. visa, and therefore, we are deporting you. Similarly, in issues like that, there are American laws that require the government to keep their public informed and warn their public uh, while they take decisions of visiting a certain place and things. So they actually also fulfill their re legal requirements when they issue these kind of war warning. All right. Thank you very much, Anwar Balsa, for your comments. Coming to you, Jinju Asab. Now, thank you. Uh, uh, one important factor that we have learned that uh, Mr. John Kirby, uh, he in fact said that uh, now, uh, since we do not have any DNA confirmation, but most likely according to the local sources, we can confirm that this is what has happened. Uh, well, there was another woman, she in fact uh, also gave an interview to one of the leading television channels. She said that, you know, it could have been a bomb, it could have been a rocket, God knows, but you know, I took my kids out. And perhaps Zawari also knew, as you rightly mentioned, that there could be a drone strike on him or he could be eliminated. <coughs> He so was. What is the guarantee that this man has actually been killed? See, uh, that guarantee, uh, as uh, Dr. Akab Malik was also saying, this is a gray, gray area because when uh, Osama bin Laden was eliminated, despite world pressure, <laughs> they did not release even the images of the body. Yeah. And they dumped him in the ocean. No DNA testing was done. Even if it was done, it 
only uh, 25 years later we'll find out. So in this particular case as well, I want to believe this was Eman al-Zawari. However, however uh, even if they will do some DNA testing, how can the first and foremost, if the Americans have no boots on the ground, who's going to recover the body? Do you think uh, Taliban are going to hand over the body to him, uh, to the Americans? No, they're not going to. So it's most unlikely, yes, if the Taliban do the, the, uh, the autopsy and DNA testing and they release the information, that's a separate story. The Americans, and maybe, maybe, the truth will come out if he wasn't the one. However, I, I just want to believe that the, such a precision attack cannot be on basis of false information. Especially when they are Sir, not... if in, you in, remember, in the they, they also had a strike right out before they were leaving. Remember? Yeah. And they, they ended up killing civilian families. However, I mean, as I said, this is a gray area. We will not know unless the Taliban come forward and say, look, we've done the autopsy and we've done the DNA testing and here are the facts. He was Eman al-Zawahri. That will prove. Now, whether it's, it remains to be seen whether they will actually accept it. Because the, in accepting, there are, there are two things, you know, that their sovereignty has been infringed. And that's what they wanted all along, that the Americans should leave. And now, in their presence, Americans come back and kill Eman al-Zawahri so they can lose uh, that popularity, that wave that they have in, domestically. What were you guys doing if the Americans still have to come back and do it? So why have you come into power? Having said that, uh, you know, it, 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 I, I mean, I feel that this, it, it didn't happen overnight. So they had some information on him. They had some information on him. And that's they, why... They, they say that since the start of the year 2022, by the way, this man was under surveillance. He was under surveillance. And for last one week, President Joe Biden was discussing with his cabinet members so to the extent that they had made a mock-up of the entire area surrounding his house and that was made to be placed inside the White House briefing room and President was made to be brief, uh, was briefed on how it's going to happen and by the way the British Embassy is only thousand feet away so they had to be very careful they didn't want to make those mistakes they had done in the past the friendly fire collateral, friendly fire or collateral damage mm. So they didn't want to do that as well. So it was a very precise action. You, I mean, until today, we don't know if there have been more casualties because of that attack in, in buildings next to the house, you know. We don't know yet. So apparently there are none. So that's why I think uh, I want to believe, but no one knows, to be honest. We don't know yet. Maybe right. the Taliban released the information. On this, I have just one comment to make. There's very important incident. We were talking about friends and blah, blah, blah. Only yesterday, do you know, there's a Khanna amendment that has been passed in the US Congress. So now the thing is, Pakistan does not fit in, we were talking, one of the participants was saying, Pakistan does not fit in the American scheme of things. Khanna amendment clearly says the, the, that the, the Indians are allowed, they will have a waiver to buy Russian products. Yes. Russian weaponry. Yes. Pakistan is not getting something like that. <coughs> and so we have passed it. a certain bill and, you know, they what? said that, well, these do not apply on India. Yeah. Perhaps for the rest of the world. But Indians are their blue-eyed boys now. So that is perhaps one of the major reasons. Now, coming to you, Dr. Kaab Malik. <coughs> According to a report that was issued by none other than the United Nations Security Council, and they said that uh, the IS and uh, the... Al-Qaeda, they are both gaining strength in Afghanistan. I want your comment on this particular statement. I think, I think uh, when it comes to the United Nations, they have more credibility on the ground uh, as far as their understanding of what's going on. But you've got to appreciate that uh, much of the United Nations is not funded uh, for intelligence gathering per se, but it's more... Um, knowledge that they acquire by being on the ground by by their own work uh, they do have their own intelligence assets uh, to some extent but but they're not funded in the same way so so they have to negotiate uh, with with the Taliban and how they act and behave in Afghanistan the last thing they want is to upset the Taliban because then that would affect uh, the humanitarian um, process and uh, activities for the general population and that's the last thing that they want but Having said that, um, uh, I, you know, uh, they're a credible source of information. 
Now, if uh, the U.S. says so, then you know you you would think that there there could be propaganda value to this, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. However, um, when you have in, uh, assets on the ground that are working for humanitarian needs, and they they indicate what's going on because it's in the interest of the humanitarian um, process that they have, there has to be taken uh, um, uh, with some form of validity here. So. At the end of the day, I think, I think maybe they are. <clears throat> the matter is, when the U.S. was in Afghanistan, they were putting pressure uh, on all the groups, essentially. Um, and they had uh, air superiority in that respect, that they, they could drone strike anybody they liked. Um, and they were taking out many uh, IS uh, and Al-Qaeda whilst they were in Afghanistan. And that's not to say that they can't now, obviously, uh, just what happened two days ago. Um, but but I, I would think that... Um, as far as IS is concerned, um, we talked about this before. When last year the Taliban took over, we, we indicated, uh, and I think there was wide recognition that, uh, and even within the ISS, uh, IS, there was an announcement by the Middle East and IS, uh, the ISIS, that the general terms of events in Middle East are unfavorable for IS at this moment in time because of what's happening in Syria and Iraq, except for Yemen maybe. Um, but Afghanistan is a new front. So they were already pushing assets into Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And the borders are so porous, it's very easy to get people in and out of the country. Um, so, uh, and Taliban are not uh, in control of the country the way a normal government is. Uh, they're learning to understand, to get into power and can take control of things, but they don't have the same assets and manpower uh, and technological know-how and how to control the border areas. It's surrounded by many countries, and uh, the border is very porous, as I mentioned. So I don't deny that. And I bet the next question you were gonna, uh, could ask is, are the Taliban um, acquiescing to this? I mean, I don't think they're acquiescing to uh, ISIS because it's a natural com strategic competitor to the Taliban in Afghanistan. Because uh, in this it, report, I, they've I, also I, mentioned that the but most uh, important members of IS and Al-Qaeda are still present in uh, Afghanistan, this is their observation, and well, well, they said that these are the thriving the networks. Of, uh, Al Qaeda was in Afghanistan, so uh, what, what does that tell you? <laughs> there are obviously other members of, of the of the groups there uh, and leadership, uh, certain aspects, but they're, they're continuing what they uh, call their form of jihad. Uh, for Al Qaeda, it's slightly different for Al Qaeda as it is to ISIS, because ISIS is an opponent of Taliban, whilst Al Qaeda because was. Uh, Taliban do not have any plan beyond the borders of Afghanistan, Afghanistan, whereas they want a proper Khilafat system. Well, you know, their interpretation of well, Khilafat is very different from what the general population of the world is. You know, their, their interpretation is very narrow, narrow in that respect, and they want a very defined 1400 years ago without understanding that the improvements of humanity and other aspects of development have taken place throughout 1400 years, that they don't want to take that, take that into account. And that's that just doesn't understand reality as it is in the world, um, to push people back in general technological, philosophical, social, economic know-how, are you going to divorce it from the modern world as it is? You cannot. So I think there has to be a degree of um, adaptation to modern reality if they're going to be successful. And this is why, in essence, they're not so successful. It's, uh, so they, they need to learn these things. That's why they're termed as extremists, because they're not willing to appreciate and understand the way the global governance structure is uh, developed, and they want to uh, change it all. Um, and it's only a small number of people. Um, and this is why they're termed as extremists. Um, and that's where the word comes from. They're way off one side of their own form of reality and it doesn't abide by where the rest of the world is going. Um, and that's why they'll never have support from the rest of the world. It just won't happen. The rest of the world wants to exist in a different reality. Um, so they're not willing to understand that. And that's why they're being cautioned off and they're being marginalized. And the, the major countries are opposed to them. China is opposed to it. The the current hegemon is opposed uh, opposed to it. Russia is opposed to it because they've got their own issues with Islamic movements uh, in Central Asia, for example, and uh, that the impacts that may have in Chechnya and, uh, and the Caucasus and, and other aspects of uh, uh, Russian uh, because there's a lot of dynamics involved in Ukraine uh, and uh, the Crimea because it was predominantly before they were uh, pushed away uh, predominantly Muslim. Uh, until uh, Stalin came. So there are a lot of other things that are involved yeah. here. 
And when you talk about these ideas in a simplistic black and white term, it doesn't work. You know, um, Al Qaeda uh, did have some leader, but but they became extremists because they attacked the governing <clears throat> hegemon in the world, uh, and they were so small. It was just a, a pinpoint attack, but they had no alternative. What are they going to provide? They're not going to provide any alternative governance structure anywhere in the world. Taliban was different, the Afghan Taliban, because they set up a government and only within Afghanistan. And the, uh, as far as Taliban itself as an organization, forget about the other groups that they associated with. They just wanted to concentrate on Afghanistan and still do. And they want to be right. part of the global governance structure. But they have to compromise in many ways, which they don't seem to appreciate yet. Yeah. Thank you very much, Akab Malik, uh, for, your, for your comments. And I would also like to thank Anwar Iqbal Saab and uh, Janjua Saab. It was a pleasure having you. And interestingly, the same report also suggests uh, that uh, uh, perhaps uh, all these groups, Al-Qaeda and IS, pose varying level of uh, threats uh, to various countries, uh, or rather, let me put it this way, to international peace. And they said that IS Khorasan, the group's Afghan-based chapter, is being seen as a bigger threat in the short and medium term, whereas Al-Qaeda is a much bigger threat in the long run. So let's see uh, what happens now. But uh, as long as we know and what the Americans have, uh, in fact, uh, mentioned that uh, Mr. Zawari is no more. He has been eliminated in a drone strike. And uh, let's assume if it is true, time will tell how things unfold. But anyway, uh, I'll see you tomorrow at 8 or 5 p.m. Till then, you take good care of yourself. Khuda Hafiz.